Noise in Bay Area. <laughs> and Harry, where the East Coast? And Kathy, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I live in Midtown. <laughs> So um, it's eight o'clock. So thank you everyone for joining on time and appreciate eight o'clock. So we'll do a quick introductory of the club. Just, and uh, the just wait one second. Um, so mute everybody. Carmen, wait, wait one second. I'm going to mute everyone if just hold before you. Hi. There's still people coming Hi. in, and I want to mute everyone and then and then let the four of you. So just, got it. Okay. So perfect. So thanks okay. everyone for joining. It's, all yours. <laughs> um, it's eight o'clock. It's not our usual time, but thank you for joining at eight o'clock on Thursday night. So a uh, quick uh, upcoming um, uh, event blurb. So obviously we have our this amazing event. And actually next week, we have another amazing event, August 31st at 12 noon Eastern time, we have a normalizing wealth in the hands of women with venture capitalist um, Victoria Song. So I think that'll be a great event, talk about you know, wealth management, et cetera. And on sept September 10th at 12 noon, we have a fireside chat with notable women on Wall Street. So Gongcha Latif Schmidt, she's the managing, managing director at Citibank. So she's going to talk about her career path and give some advice on, you know, uh, on career, especially in finance. Um, and uh, if you're not a member yet, please remember to sign up. You will get exclusive events and also you can participate in the annual Rising Star nomination process. Um, you don't know what's normal the Rising Star Awards, um, please feel free to reach out to Kathy and me. So my name is Carmen, I graduated in 16. I'm really excited to host this um, panel discussion with three amazing, amazing um, speakers. So the first we have Joy, um, she's a friend of the club. Uh, if you, some of you remember, she actually came to speak with us before. So she's the CEO and the founder of MAI. MAI is a, a global leading AI company for the social commerce sector. Um, before MAI, she actually was working as a lead AI strategist in high frequency, tra high frequency trading. And before that, she went to MIT for undergrad. And then she also won the global um, math um, com um, Olympic competition. Uh, so she's an amazing woman and she has a lot of data insights in the e-commerce especially space. And next we have Charlotte. Uh, so she is a vice president at L Carrington, a focus on the firm's cross fund investments and portfolio operations. Before this role, she um, was um, in consultant with McKinsey and she went to Harvard for undergrad as well as uh, MBA from HBS. So welcome Charlotte. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, and last, definitely not the least, we have Terry. <laughs> so Terry is a man with really no uh, no introduction. So she is the ex-CEO of Macy's, um, operator of Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Blue Mercury, and one of the largest retail e-commerce business in America. She retired from Macy's in 18, um, but he is still uh, very active. He was on, he's on the board of PNG right now and the Carnegie Hall and the Economic Club of New York. So he has so many industry insights and we can't wait to uh, dig into the details and you know have a great conversation. So thank you guys for being here. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, so before I jump in, I'd love for you guys to share a little bit more about yourself other than your bio and then just hear more about in your experience particularly in retail and shop you know shopping <laughs> so terry why don't we start with you sure uh thanks carmen so yes as carmen said i i uh, retired after a long long uh career in retail i was the ceo of neiman marcus before i came back to federated department stores and eventually we changed both the the name of the corporation to macy's inc and and changed 400 department stores uh, to get a round out to become uh, the largest fashion uh, department store in the United States called, and we changed all those names to, to Macy's. And they, we did that about 15 years ago. Um, and and um, since then, since I've retired, I've stayed active on a number of subjects. I have four companies that um, I work with uh, very closely and, and others I work with occasionally, but four that I work with regularly, 
one based in London, one based in Hong Kong, and two uh, in America. I work specifically with uh, Joy Tang. Uh, as Carmen said, she's an amazing young woman, and uh, that's, what, that's what attracts me these days is that um, I've been fortunate to be able to only now work with people that I really enjoy and, uh, and learn from, and, and, and Joy Tang, is, uh, one, one, she's one of those special people, and, and uh, so I'm happy to be on this, uh, on this uh, call with her and with you, Carmen. Thank you, and with Charlotte. <laughs> Great. Joy, you want to go next? Wow. <laughs> I hope I can live up to Terry's uh, praises. Um, so first of all, I'm really happy to be here, you know, with Terry and Charlotte. Um, Terry is a mentor for me and, you know, he taught me so many things. I would say I probably learned way more from him than he has learned from me. <laughs> and uh, a little introduce myself. Um, I graduated from MIT. So, you know, close to Harvard. I actually took some classes at Harvard as well. I have a Harvard student ID. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, this is my third startup. My first startup was actually a um, copycat for Facebook, but facing Chinese speaking overseas students. At that first startup, I built in college and it was extremely successful. We monopolized some whole global market within a year and a half, and I sold it to a Chinese social media company. So this is my third startup. Uh, now this startup is focusing on uh, social commerce um, because we actually realized 70% of the Gen Z prefer to shop on content than go directly to a retailer store. So, you know, uh, time is money and if people spend more time on social media, then that's where you want to capture the traffic of what people are inspired by these beautiful images and photo videos on social media. So my basically makes any content instantly shoppable. Um, I do want to add a little more that, you know, this is my second time here and I'm really excited. So from the first time I was at HBS, I got one investor from the audience <laughs> and I got one client from the audience and also might become an investor for one of the uh, uh, audience startup. Um, so it's a really fruitful a fruitful you know experience for me and it's amazing to be here with all these other strong women you know from harvard business school awesome so glad to hear that joy um hopefully everything gonna gonna go very very well for this time as well so charlotte yeah thank you Carmen, for the invitation it's a great pleasure to be on the panel with joy and terry and to speak with you guys today i obviously have a ton of affection for hbs and for harvard unfortunately joy i don't have an mit student id i wish i did <laughs> <laughs> a lot of my friends were cross-registering at mit to take your stat classes actually when i was an undergrad but um just very quickly about me i grew up in shanghai um, but then went to the u.s for my college education and relocated back to asia about a year ago to help with the funds sort of cross-border operations both in investing and to post investment uh, sort of new market entry so shopping and consumerism has always been near and dear to my heart because when i was growing up my dad used to manage a fashion magazine so every week i would every month i would leave through hundreds and hundreds of pages of magazines and just look at the advertisement and really think about you know why do these things make people want to buy what they're selling and so that sort of planted a seed very early on and then I studied psychology and economics when I was at Harvard. So that sort of continued with this trend of thinking about what makes people buy? Why do people pay for what they pay for at the price points that they do? And so I think that fascination just stayed with me throughout my career at McKinsey. And then as I moved to El Catterton, El Catterton is the world's largest consumer focused PE fund. We manage about 30 billion USD in assets and we have six different fund platforms focus on investing in brands and some selectively in the upstream of the value chain across the world. And so I moved over from our Greenwich headquarters close to New York City back to Shanghai, but I spent a lot of time with our global portfolio brands as they think about going from the Europe and the US to China and in other directions. Um, and I also work on cross-border investments uh, with the example of Birkenstock, um, which is a like 250-year-old German shoe brand, which we bought majority control of earlier this year. So I'm happy to speak to um, any of our investments, consumer trends in general. I spent a lot of time thinking about them and super excited for the conversation today. 
Thank you, Shala. This is great. I, you know, there's so much great experience we can dig in. So before I start questions, I just let the audience know that feel free to enter your question in the chat box or raise your hand on the line. We want to make this conversational. A few questions prepared for the panelists, but feel free to uh, jump in and raise your hand. Um, Kathy and I will help monitoring as well. So our first question is for three, all three of you. So the National Retail Federation in the U.S. Boost the industry outlook for this year, seeing anticipates the fastest growth that we have ever seen in the U.S. since 1984. So do you really think 2021 or next year are going to be the best years for retail? Harry, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think for me, it's a relatively easy one, I think. First of all, I was chairman of the National Retail Federation twice. <laughs> <laughs> during my tenure and but uh and I, so i have a lot of respect for that organization but but i you know i look the economy just is, is growing very very quickly in the united states that where we grew at 6.6 percent last quarter as an example which is basically triple what we were we were uh how we were growing just a couple of years ago so so i you know i, I we are clearly on a path for a a very robust uh, G, uh, GDP growth, and keep keep in mind that two thirds of, of GDP is, is driven by consumption, and so the consumer has plenty of money. As you all know, we've got we 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 haven't really been spending actively because we couldn't in the last year and a half, right? And so and yet there has been an accumulation of, of wealth for those who have been involved in the in the stock market. There's been a tremendous uh, amount of. Uh, growth creation uh, for those who participated in the last you know 18 months certainly um, and then for those who are at the the lower end of the of the income spectrum the the benefits that have been provided by our our, our gov government with stimulus packages uh, has also been very very helpful and so so this has left the consumer with record savings accounts record savings accounts and so they have money there's pent up demand to spend that money. We as Americans tend to spend most of, of our savings. And so it's just a matter of the economy opening up and, and the opportunities that present themselves. Apparel, as an example, is an event-driven purchase. And so when there are events again, whether that's dating or back to school or, or going out to dinner, whatever concerts, whatever it is, you will buy, we will buy apparel, we will buy accessories, we will buy shoes, jewelry, et cetera, for those occasions. And, and so, so I, I think there's a lot of, of, of potential for this to be strong through the, the second half of, of 2021 and deep into 2022. Uh, so, so the answer is yes. I strongly believe uh, we're going to be in a, an excellent position for retailers to grow over these next 18 months. Great, awesome. That's exciting to hear. Joy, what do you think? Any data point of view? Definitely. I, I think you know. Besides 20, 2021, 2022 is going to be the best year. I actually think 2025 might be the best year. Um, besides that, you know, everyone is saving their budget <laughs> for until everything's open. I think the retailers uh, brands are also starting to understand the consumers more. I've seen way more recommendation that is relevant to me before I feel like when I'm shopping on you know retailer website, it's almost like I have to take the initiative to discover things. But now I feel like I can take a more of a passive role and things I like will be recommended to me. But that's also one of the things we do well here. And we believe that, you know, learning the consumer will allow them to spend more. <laughs> nice. Charlotte, what do you see in APEC or other parts of the globe? Yeah, I say, you know, I, I think I, I leave the US market to Terry and Joy for the real experts, but I can add a little bit of color from the China side. I think globally, I would echo that the trends towards more um, sort of technology infused products, more consumer understanding, better algorithm to push on personalization and customization that will continue globally. And we've been seeing a ton of business model innovation and new formats, live streaming and so on, which we can talk more about in a sec. So I think all of that will continue. I think the one perhaps not so optimistic note that I will strike is a lot of what is happening in China, as you guys may or may not be aware on the line, is policy driven. So there's been a bout of regulatory changes sweeping across your real estate, education, tech, and so on, uh, industries in China. And so that will likely affect little things. I mean, important things like 
how much data the, the tech companies will be able to collect from their users and to what extent can they put that to use. Um, and also with this new sort of common prosperity language um, in the new policy announcements in the last two uh, in the last two weeks, there is concern around how much is that going to affect the luxury market? You know, you're carrying an LVMH, the stocks have been dropping quite a bit. And does that more broadly affect the premiumization trend? You know, that's something that I worry about as an investor in the market. So I'd say, broadly speaking, I echo the optimism around consumer enthusiasm to spend better products, better technology and all of that. But I think in China in particular, there is nuance of, okay, what is the policy environment going to be? And is that going to stand in the way um, in some form? Got it, that's interesting. Wow, so um, another interesting observation, McKinsey, your, uh, Charlie, your previous employer <laughs> actually published a paper saying that um, they estimate five American companies in the retail index generated more than 80% of all value created in the U.S. retail, with Amazon alone accounting for almost 60% of those gains. So in China, meanwhile, four players drove a staggering 98% of gains in retail market capitalization. So do you think big companies are positioned to win everything or how about smaller players? So Terry, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Well, I, I think what happened during, again, during the pandemic was that many of us went to the most reliable sources uh, for the products that, that, that we needed. And of course, the larger players that you mentioned, Amazon and America, Walmart, uh, Target, uh, Home Depot, benefited uh, from this. And, 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 and they also carried products that were relevant to the work and the services and the products that, that consumers desired during home improvement uh, was a big, big subject. Of course, food, they all, you know, most of those retailers are big food providers. And so it was easy going to the big, the, the big players. They're reliable. They, they take back returns. Their shipping is generally free. You know, they made it easy, right? And so, so that was then. And I think, and and Charlie can speak better to this and Joy than I can. But but I know the same was true. Alibaba and and JD and and others benefited from this this moment in time where ease of shopping from those reliable you know strong players existed. But I I personally think that there's a, 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 again, a pent up demand, if that's the right, right word on the part of consumers to get back to experiencing doing business with smaller retailers once again, finding special products that they're not finding, you know, in mass retailers, finding things that are unique and special for them. And they're going to find those in, in, in more localized and smaller, even mid-sized and fashion retailers. That's where they're gonna find them. And, and I, so I do believe that that will happen over time when everybody feels safe about re-entering that shopping uh, habit once again. Great. So Joy, I know you're working with a lot of big players in the space. Do you mind commenting on the question? Yeah, uh, I actually would like to uh, connect the first question and the second question. I do want to add a little more, you know, continue what Charlotte mentioned about the security of data. Um, so uh, we also were aware of like the new security law coming up in China about, you know, device and personal information. So, uh, however, so far that hasn't really slowed the retail industry. Um, it slowed a few other industries, but not retail so far because the retail data, you know, what consumers have liked, uh, what they purchases, still consider not privacy data. Um, so I think there's different categories of um, privacies and then retail data somehow consider, you know, not in the privacy area. So, so I think uh, continuously, I'm, I'm very, I'm still very optimistic about retail technology going forward. And second of all, uh, the second question about, you know, the giants taking over the market, uh, I think that's, a uh, so uh, China, the, the Chinese player definitely, they they skipped, you know, the internet, <laughs> you know, dot com period. So they kind of uh, went directly from, you know, having no online to directly to Alibaba, JD period, where everything was centralized. So I think it makes sense for China, um, retail giants to gain 98% of the market. But at the same time, I'm sure uh, people who watch the Chinese stock market are realizing now like Alibaba, JD, 
their stock market, I mean, Tencent, they're suffering because <laughs> the government is realizing this is becoming an issue and they're uh, basically, you know, the government even made very bold statements saying that, you know, we're willing to sacrifice some of the giants to save uh, millions of those mi middle and small players. So um, actually, um, right now, the government is investing heavily in smaller and medium uh, retail companies, even ourselves, like we have a entity in China, and we also recently got government funding. Um, so I think, you know, uh, it does take some government control, because yes, the bigger guys will get bigger. <laughs> So uh, I think U.S. relatively is more, you know, um, is a, you know, capitalism. Um, however, I do think, you know, for fashion, um, particularly this sector, I would say Amazon is still uh, quite behind. There's many other, you know, fashion retailers that people spend, you know, if you count Macy's <laughs> fashion sales alone. Like I would say, you know, Amazon, um, the, the growth of Amazon fashion is still quite slow like people still only buy even yoga pants you know socks this type of items from amazon like the standard items but um so i think for these big giant retailer uh, like harry mentioned they like to feel safe and buy these standardized products but for products that are specialized um people still tend to uh, you know seek these comfort from you know niche brand because they felt connected with the brand and so I, I think in the future, there are going to be more competition in the fashion retail market in the U.S. as well. Great. Shella, do you want to add to this question? Yeah, I, I think Tara and Joy made a lot of good points already. But I think to return to your original question of, you know, is it true that the big players are going to capture most of the gain in the market? I think you have to really time box that question around what has happened so far and what is going to happen in the future. And I think, again, my perspective is more China oriented. I'd say looking backward, the data that you cited, right, the 80 percent, 90 something percent of the big four in China capturing most of the gain. A lot of that is locked in during the pandemic, during the phase that year before the regulatory changes really hit, um, when the big platform players, like Terry was discussing earlier, are best positioned to leverage their really broad ecosystem of resources and use that platform to push a lot of change because they have so much skill advantage. So for instance, things that really happen and change consumer behavior in a more permanent way than the rest are things like the, 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 the sort of uh, the turbocharged growth of live streaming as a way to sell, and that was a lot of that was driven by Alibaba. And then eventually now you see that seeping into players like TikTok. But that really took off during the pandemic. And that's not the only player. You have your mate fun and the likes doing food delivery and so on. They were able to basically leverage their massive MAU, DAU during the pandemic to push new innovation. And Pinduoduo, likewise, on your list, um, benefited from this massive wave of continued e-commerce penetration, consumers in lower tier cities looking for a bargain and finding new business models to add value to everybody in, this, in the ecosystem. So I'd say looking backward, especially pre-May, June this year, it is not a surprise that you see a lot of stock market gains for the large players. That reflects only the par public market side of the picture. The private market where we are an active investor in have also seen a really heated, almost overheated year of investments in the consumer space. So, you know, all in all, that's kind of what has happened so far. Really good sort of um, momentum for everybody, public and private markets including uh, included. But I think looking forward is where we shift to the, to the regulatory note that we talked about earlier, what Joy has already alluded to. Obviously, over the last, let's say, six months, gradually, some more abrupt, abruptly, players like Alibaba, Meituan, Tencent, you see them sort of basically getting hit one by one. And I agree with Terry's point earlier, where a certain degree of regulatory scrutiny is certainly needed in China. It's similar to the approach in the U.S., where the government kind of like let, let big players like Google and Facebook develop um, and then retroactively apply regulatory barriers when you realize they have too much power and too much data to rein that in a little bit. Um, but I think going forward, because of this context, you probably will see large players being a lot more cautious and more probably much of the innovation and a lot of the gain going to private market players. So your startups, your small, medium sized businesses, where the only wrinkle in that story I would add is 
because the consumer market in China has been so overheated from an investing perspective. I think over the next year or two, at least I expect to see valuation drop more investors pull out of the market because valuation is just so high. And I think the market will enter a phase of sort of, sort of equilibrium self-adjustment um, before it goes more into a normalized state, if that makes sense. Oh, interesting. Wow. That's interesting from the both public and the private sector's perspective. So next question um, is about COVID and period. So how did COVID change the retail industry and customer behavior? I mean, globally, right? Do you think those changes are here to stay? So we're going to switch to all a little bit. Uh, Charlotte, do you mind go first? Yeah, of course. Happy to. I, I mean, I think I already, this seg- there's a nice segue from my last answer. We talked about more permanent changes in consumer behavior. So the way that people shop, the way that people connect with brands and sort of, you know, live their day-to-day lives change in more permanent ways during COVID because of the rise of live streaming, because of the popularity of group buying and um, sort of online food deliveries. But I think beyond these, we actually ran a global consumer survey in March, April this year um, with, I think, 15,000 samples from seven countries just asking consumers, hey, how are you feeling about the pandemic? Do you think the worst is behind us? How have you changed your behavior and what do you expect to do going forward? And I think there's a lot of detail in there, but the most interesting takeaways that stuck with me, two behaviors that people self-reportedly reportedly will continue to do more of in the future. One is actually vitamin consumption uh, amongst millennials and Gen Z in Asia. So that has come to be one of our core tenets or core principles of, okay, do we want, you know, let's look for a target that plays to the species in Asia. And the context for that is unsurprising, right? During the during COVID, you have more people uh, becoming more self-conscious about how they're regulating their health. They want to take better care of themselves. Um, it's just that amongst your millennials and Gen Z, vitamin and supplement taking wasn't necessarily a popular behavior. But I think people's mindset is shifting and they at least, again, self-report that they will do more of that in the future. So that's interesting. The other one I have a bit of a question about, but from the data, it seems interesting uh, as a trend is people self-reportedly also want to do more workouts at home. And so um, our previous investment in the US, like Peloton and Hydro, these are smart at home workout devices, similar to Mirror, really benefited from that. And I think we are expecting perhaps to see the timing be ripe for that in Asia too. But I think that trend will probably take a little bit longer to play out. Um, The last note that I'll add is what people did a lot during COVID, but they won't necessarily continue afterwards. And that primarily has to do with in-person engagements. So by and large, you see people who are parents, teachers, professionals self-report that, yes, I did a lot of online schooling for my children during COVID. I did a ton of video conferencing with my friends and families to socialize during COVID. So we just cannot wait to shift that back into in-person engagement once this is over. Yeah, I totally feel that. I mean, homeschooling is not my thing, at least. I tried it. It's not working for my, me and my two girls. So, yeah. but Terry, yeah, I'd love to do this in person. <laughs> exactly. Can't wait, to be honest. So, Terry, what do you think? Well, I think I think you know Charlotte makes some good points, and specifically about you know what products are we going to buy, you know, in the future that were not necessarily on our radar screen in the past, and I think there are many of those. Um, I do think we have enough uh, gym gym clothes now. I think we have enough sweatpants, you know. Oh boy, and, I think yeah, I overbought them. We have enough T-shirts, but um, you know. But eventually, you know, there you know, we're going to shift back and and buy other things. I do think, you know, one of the biggest changes. First of all, I, I should point out, you know, shopping behavior in China is very different than shopping behavior in the United States, and 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 China was far earlier and and far more developed in terms of consuming more products online versus America. Back, just dial back to 2019 pre-COVID. America only purchased 12% of our products online, 12%. Think about that. I mean, most people think it's much, much higher. It was only 12%, 88% of the business was being done in physical stores. And then of course that changed dramatically through, through COVID. And now it's sort of, you know, working its way back down again, but it's gonna still be double what it was versus 19, but 
keep that in mind. It's that, that means 75% of the business is still going to be done in physical stores in, you know, in, in the future, late, you know, fourth quarter and into 2022. And so, so, you know, think about that. What, one of the key changes for sure is food purchasing, right? And, and so that's something that was, they, they had like a 2% penetration before, uh, be, before the pandemic in the United States of purchasing your groceries online. It was a very, very small and expensive business. And, and today that number has shot up dramatically. And, and I think most of us feel comfortable buying many products uh, of food products and grocery related products online and that that I, that won't change i think i think we'll we'll continue to to purchase that way but it won't be the same amount because there still is that desire just like there's a desire to try on a, you know apparel there's that desire to squeeze the avocado you know and so so i do believe that we're going to see this shift back and and have that in-person experience affect many of these businesses the you know related to this is 40% of apparel that was purchased last year online was returned. So that cannot be a positive experience for the retailer, by the way, or the consumer. So the consumer is definitely going to migrate back, perhaps to a hybrid model, omni-channel shopping model, more so than in the past, in the United States certainly, where they'll want to buy it online or certainly reserve it online and then go try it on touch the product feel the product see how it feels and looks and their how their friends feel about it at the same time uh, and then make their purchase which would be good for both the consumer in terms of a positive experience and significantly better for the retailer because far less likely to be be returned so so I, there are going to be changes and they're obviously you know, we're all talking about the the change in the work environment you know i do believe there'll be a hybrid it's not going to be what it was before and it's not going to be what it is currently it's going to be more of a hybrid model still evolving a lot of ceos that i speak to desperately want their employees to come back to work a lot of our young employees desperately do not want to go back to the office so so we're going to have a a little conflict that's going to play out over time and we'll see but i believe it'll ultimately res resolve itself in a in a hybrid so i think yes many many uh habits are going to stick but i think will be moderated over time 40 percent return oh my god as a customer yeah. I return from time to time but that's staggering joy what do you think i know you have business both in the us and apex so yeah 40 percent is definitely the average us? Definitely the average in the U.S. Uh, I think it's also related to, you know, we have a lot more ethnicities in the U.S. People have a lot more different body shapes. Uh, in Asia, you know, people are relatively same sizes. <laughs> so, like, there's lots of fashion brands in Asia. They were just like one size fits all. <laughs> like, it's, it's really interesting. I think the return rate in Asia right now, it's also not low. It's like 10 to 20%. Uh, but this is like very standard. It's like every brands have to do, every retailer have to deal with return. It's just like, you know, one of the biggest costs for running a retail business. Um, I, I also like wanted to, you know, uh, add a little more to what Charlotte was mentioning on the, uh, the investor pulling money out of consumer space. Uh, I do, I do see that, you know, the investors are, you know, very not optimistic about, you know, the, the giants <laughs> in China, you know, a lot of people are pulling their money out, their stocks are dropping, but I do see another trend that investors are pushing a lot more and more money in the cross-border, you know, consumer experience, for example, you know, the, uh, the supply chains, uh, the supply chains in China are very robust advanced. And uh, right now, you know, we have quite a few cross-border, uh, e-commerce platform in the U.S., for example, Shein, you know, the famous one, and then a few others are coming into the player to, to try to, you know, win the hearts of American consumers with cheap products from China, but uh, produced really fast and within 10 to 15 days. So I think, you know, um, you know, we, we also work with Shein and we also starting to work with the supply chain of Shein as well. I, I think, you know, in the future, you know, how fast you can produce things people want is going to be also to meet the, uh, the, the instant gratification of the Gen Z <laughs> when they see something they like. 
they want it right away. Uh, I would say like COVID made a lot of people lazier. <laughs> and I think that laziness will last for a little bit. Uh, you, know, you know, like uh, Terry mentioned, like, you know, you don't want to go back to work anymore. You want to work from home. You know, you get used to spending more time with your kids. You know, uh, you might actually enjoy not having a nanny <laughs> for some people. And, uh, but there's also like the consumer laziness, like people realize, oh, I can find all these things from online. You know, there's an older group where typically they don't even go online to shop. And now they realize, oh, you know, for example, even my parents, they have to learn how to pick up, you know, use <laughs> use the apps to shop. And previously they just walked to the stores and they were hated to use any app and to put in their credit card. But now they all have to do it. So once they're realizing how easy it is, they tend to do more for that. But I think uh, there's also, like Terry mentioned, like they're never going to take away the offline experience. You know, even for me, I, I really dream of the day when I can walk in <laughs> these big department stores again, which I haven't for almost a year and a half. Uh, but I think uh, we don't need that many stores anymore. I think the department, uh, you know, the offline stores are almost becoming a you know, offline advertising spot, like a, like a showroom to show you the quality of the product so you can touch it, you know, squeeze it. Um, but, you know, there's, but people also realize is there's more options online and sometimes you use a coupon online, you actually get better price than offline. So I think that will be a continued struggle um, for, you know, uh, it's going to be a shift between consumer behavior where people go to offline store to experience things, but then they might want to actually shop online. So I think, you know, big retailers really have to connect their offline and online divisions. Otherwise, they're going to have a hard time having internal conflicts. <laughs> wow, yeah, for sure. This is great observation. So just follow up on that question, Joy. Um, um, do you mind touch on uh, a few things that I think might, might be interesting for the for the audience? So China's ecosystem, we talk about that. They're really good at embracing online content, such as short videos and live streaming to fuel sales. Since you're working in the sort of e uh, social commerce sector, do you see that kind of trend in China continue and adopted by other countries as well? Well, for sure. U.S. is already starting. Um, you know, I, I was actually excited to see you know there's more and more you know influencers in the us now and more and more influencer monetization tool um i myself know quite a few startups that focus on you know SaaS model for influencers to make money so that because i think in the past i actually tried to do my own b2c app that's my second startup i didn't mention because it was kind of a failure <laughs> <laughs> My second startup was to, you know, allow U.S. influencers to upload their content, beautiful content, and tag the product, so like a social commerce. But that was back in, you know, 2014 to 2016. And at that time, the U.S. influencer has a really high entry to barrier. Like you almost have to be, you have to be super beautiful, and you have to have a boyfriend or husband that knows how to take good photos or videographer <laughs> to become a blogger, an influencer in the US. When you come here to China that, you know, you can be a farmer, you know, as long as you have a LED light at home, you have a nice, you know, uh, microphone, USB microphone. Now it's like a standard package you can buy in China, like LED light and US, my USB microphone that now you're a blogger. So, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in China, they all, all, all have these softwares that automatically makes you pretty, makes your eyes bigger, makes your chin smaller. <laughs> you know, they don't, you, you can't even see their blemish anymore. So, but I think US now, we still tend to stay more realistic to who we are. That culture, I think it's gonna stay for a while. But I also see the young, you know, Gen Z. I have cousins who are 16 and 14. I've seen them, you know, using the software to make themselves not looking like themselves anymore. I think that culture is also starting in the US. And soon I think we're gonna see, you know, TikTok is already bringing all these you know, micro influencers. Um, they see how easy it is to become an influencer. And we're also, you know, starting to work with TikTok. Um, uh, social commerce so allow these influencers to tag the products easily find the product so they can sell them as well so everyone you know i, I think that's going to start in the us when china is already 
reach the peak, like Charlotte mentioned, there's actually a, a city in China that uh, was, you know, where Kuai Shou was in, become rich because, uh, you know, it's a TikTok competitor in China called Kuai Shou, because everyone in the city become a blogger. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but, but now the city actually become poor again, because I think that wave just passed. So, right. um, so now people are focusing more and more on like the quality of the content. Not everyone can become a con bloggers. I think China is, is going through that massive explosion. And now they're like, you know, now it's only the, the top bloggers can make money. But in the US, you know, we haven't even started to explode yet, but we're just starting. Nice. So Terry, what do you think? Do you see a lot of, uh, I guess, content monetization coming to the US, more well, video streaming? Definitely, uh, I do. I, I, we, you know, we we thought so a couple of years ago, and I think um, we 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 were actually beginning to. Some of us were beginning to invest in in this subject because we saw it coming, replacing you know still photography, replacing magazines, replacing uh, even websites of of uh, of the stagnant product. And and I think actually one of the you know what what was interesting to me with Joy's uh, company was one of her capabilities was to to identify product while it was in motion you know and i and and most of the technology that had been developed uh, prior to that was uh, just getting uh getting to the point where they were getting good uh fairly good at identifying still product and so that was a big difference and a big breakthrough i think in in joy's uh and and my te technology um that that was ahead of the game in in this regard and i think it's going to be ex extremely important because i think i think that's what i think that that's part of the entertainment value that consumers are looking for you know motion and streaming is is going to be i think definitely be something that's going to carry forward and become uh much more of a, of a favorable uh way to to view product and experiences than what we've had in the past so strongly believe in it believe there's still opportunity to invest along this uh th this subject you've just got to find the right uh the right companies that are doing it well i actually think i think i actually think joy is still uh, a bit ahead of what other uh competitors i've seen on this subject nice Carla, how about you do you see any interesting trying to adopt it outside china or even in china what's the latest development Gosh, there's so much. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but I think to stick with the topic, I, I think Joy and Terry both touched on a lot of really good points around how is the influencer economy in the U.S. going to be monetized and what business model is going to emerge in the future. But I think if I were to narrow the scope a little bit strictly to the question of live streaming, because I thought I saw that there was a question around that in the audience and in the audience discussion, too. We've been asking ourselves this since I came back last year, which is given the rapid rise, right? The whole industry has doubled over the last couple of years, given the rise of live streaming as a business model, a market of its own in China, is it going to play out in similar ways in the US or in Europe? This model of you going into a live streaming room, somebody is talking about a product, you can drop it into your shopping cart and then complete the payment seamlessly and using that light, like a, that, that narrative and that environment really being the experience of purchasing of its own. I think our assessment so far is that uh, a lot of players in the US are attempting to um, replicate the same model, but some of the basic infrastructures and this fundamental consumer behavior and why they're drawn to the live streaming room is quite different in, in unique markets. So yes, monetization and sort of the visualization will continue to happen, but live streaming purchase probably won't happen as it plays out in the same way in China. Specifically, in China, because of the large player ecosystem and their very extensive capabilities we talked about, players like Alibaba can really integrate your product assortment, matching that up with the right KOL, completing payment transaction, and sort of delivering the order all in one go. In the U.S., the ecosystem is a lot more fragmented. The capability sure. of payment, logistics, all of KOL, MCN, MCN, and so on are more dispersed across multiple players. So for the experience to be wholly integrated and seamless, I think, takes more effort. And it takes more time for these players to align their interests in their processes. And so that is one thing. The, the fundamental underlying infrastructure look quite different. And the other piece is 
why consumer go into these live streaming rooms, right? In the US, you've always had QVC. In China, I think what's what what's interesting is live streaming has become uh, heavily about discounts. And so people go there for steep prices and they also go there for the entertainment value because they almost become fans of your KOLs. The two biggest ones uh, being Wei Yag and uh, Li Zaxi, so Via and Austin Lee. These are the two most famous names you'll hear about live streaming stars in China. And so they provide not just good economical value, but also entertainment value. They chat for hours, typically four hours with their fans every night. They bring celebrities into their live streaming rooms to do sales alongside them. So all of that has evolved into a, quite a unique ecosystem and buying behavior in China. Um, but to wrap this whole thought bubble up, what I'd say is specifically on live streaming, I think many players in the U.S. are attempting to deliver this business model. It probably will come out looking quite different for infrastructural and for behavioral reasons. Wow, this is great. Yeah, it's a great observation. So I'd love to open the floor to the um, uh, other uh, um, attendees. So if you want to raise your hand, I know there's a question in the chat room. So um, there's a lot of yeah, how about How about getting Amanda on uh, if you want to raise your hand and unmute Amanda? You had a question, uh, I think, about metaversing. Metaverses, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. Um, I don't remember how to raise my hand in the app, but I'll just speak to it. Yeah, I just was wondering what I feel like it's not, definitely not a new concept, but there's a lot of buzz, I think, right now around the metaverse, especially in context of stuff that that Facebook is is working on. And I was just wondering about what's happening there in terms of shopping and how retailers are thinking about um, experiences within um, metaverses beyond just e-commerce and, and physical retail, etc. Good question. I, I, I'll just say, listen, I'm learning about it as others are learning about it. And I think you've got, you know, spokespeople out there like Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, and Eric Schmidt who are talking about this, this, this metaverse and we're all trying to catch up and, and, and understand how does that translate into, uh, you know, a retail, retail transaction. And I'm actually not not sure about it, so I'm going to throw it back to Charlotte and and uh, and, and Joy to uh, to answer the question better than I just have. No, I think it's a great question, and Terry. Similarly, I think as investors who primarily focus on growth and late stage invest uh, opportunities, it's a trend that we're certainly seeing the the rise of metaverse and the NFTs and so on. But it feels too nascent and too niche for be to be investable. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not tracking how people are innovating around it. I think some of the brands, especially luxury brands, really trying to become relevant and innovative, speaking to young consumers who are super edgy these days, they're spending, investing a lot of resources thinking about how do we play to that space? How do we come up with fashionable NFTs, even if there's no physical good, but still have it be highly valued and highly prized. Um, I, I think net net, my perspective on this is we are still learning about it as well. It's too early stage for us to invest behind it. And I think for brands to figure out, for brands to figure out a scaled strategy in terms of how to play. So right now, innovation is still driven by sort of uh, small players, um, but it's a space that we're watching. I don't know. I think Joy might have more perspective yeah. here as a, as a tech, tech <laughs> I do player. think, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, Charlotte's view as an investor, you know, I do want people to know that uh, investors' mindset is they have to turn 100 yes into 99 no and one yes. So, so yeah. they, they, you're, it's, it's investors' job to be very cautious, uh, only invest when the trend actually picks up, right? Yes. So, but it's the entrepreneur's job to, when you see a little bit of tipping of trending up, you should go all in. That's the entrepreneur's job because you want to be the first when the trend is picking up. So I don't, you know, I'm sure people already seeing the kind of like, um, we have similar knowledge, but we have very different perspective, but that's, you know, our roles are different. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, we have to turn a hundred no's <laughs> into one yes. Why Charlotte is supposed to turn a hundred yes into you know ninety nine no's. So, so that's uh, that's a maybe difference in our answers. Um, uh, actually, it's interesting because one of my friend in Facebook, he's in charge of his job is to turn Facebook into the next Amazon. 
<laughs> so every day I see posts from him talking about how Facebook is going to win Amazon down the road because they have, you know, more users spending, sp users are spending more time on Facebook than on Amazon. But I think, you know, uh, I think social media are definitely picking up on retail, you know, uh, Facebook have their own Facebook market, you know, Snapchat is now working on their own Snapchat market. And actually TikTok, uh, TikTok, you know, um, is starting their TikTok e-commerce division this year, um, but it's probably going to form in six months. So like, uh, but it's still agreeing with what Terry and Shirley mentioned, you know, the US is actually definitely a, a step behind. And it's what is going to come out the social commerce is going to be different than what has come out in the US. But I think the overall trend of, you know, people wanted to buy on content because they spend more time on content. I think that trend is not going to, you know, it's not going to go away because that's human nature. The more you spend time on content, the more you get inspired, the more you're, you know, you're itchy to buy something. But the whole experience right now, even in the U.S., is still, it's not seamless like in China, where you know you can click on buy and then everything at one one platform. Um, but there's multiple companies starting up. You know, I we are doing you know the piece of we're doing the you know the sh uh, shopping discovery. So whenever someone see a content, they can immediately discover products. And we're also now adding pieces to fulfill the whole ecosystem. For example, you know, fulfillment parts and, uh, you know, making the checkout seamless. These are all the pieces we're working on. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, and I think, you know, last time when I speak at, you know, Harvard Business School, there's multiple women reached out afterwards that they're all starting their own, you know, fashion, e-commerce startup or related startup. Um, I, I think, you know, everyone is correct that this is the trend. Um, I, I do believe, you know, Amazon is not going to be the only player. Uh, I actually think there's going to be multiple fashion marketplace, even Shein already taking a big cut of the market already. And I think we're going to see more because, you know, Amazon is a place where people, can, can, you are price sensitive. You know, whenever you shop on Amazon, you're always thinking about, can I get a better price? But there's this other group of people there. Uh, quality focus, they want to see more experience of the product. So I think those going to be um, the new way of shopping, especially for the fashion sector that, you know, because we're, you know, I, I'm in the fashion sector. So uh, fashion is a huge industry, but in, yes, for like tissue paper, <laughs> you know, and uh, these, you know, sanitizer, these things going to be, you know, um, a competition between Walmart you know, Amazon, these players. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I try to sell my daughter's art and, and, and as NFT art. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's an interesting experiment. Who knows, right? So, um, yeah, it's a great question. So we have a, a few questions in the chat, 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 um, chat um, uh, Zoom, I think. One of the questions from Kathy is, any training guys see about, you know, vegan environmental issues surrounding clothing? Um, Terry, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of of not just work being done, but I think this is what I, I've always I've always said to you know to, to anyone who is focused on 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 trying to improve the world, improve the environment, improve social conditions. You know, use your pocketbook. You know, to to make your point known. You know, use your pocketbook. So if you really feel strongly that you want to uh, have apparel companies um, work more responsibly and then ha be more responsible for the, the, the workers around the world, the, the, the way that the garments are made and the like, then then buy that way. You know, do your research and find out who you respect and purchase from the, those companies. And when and when, that's how you move the needle on this subject. And I, first of all, it's easy for us all to agree that these are just simply the right things to do. But for we've known this for decades, and we've made little progress. And so, to me, I feel very passionate about this subject. That the way we're going to to change the the actual impact um, on ESG related issues, including by the way, DNI as well, is 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 acting with our wallets, with our with our pocketbook, and and when when we spend in 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 favor of responsible companies, responsible brands, because 
of the initiatives that they have taken and we hold them accountable for those initiatives that's how, that's when we're going to affect change and i and i think you're, you're starting to see more and more in america i can just speak for in, in the united states where you're starting to see more and more of these disclosures uh, coming out in these annual reports and and, and and taking responsibility for for these actions and i think this is a really good thing uh, but ultimately when consumers and i think this young the, the, the z generation in particular is, is already showing signs that they are going to be the ones who are going to make this change not just talk about it but effectively spend against their uh, their standards their initiatives uh, that 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 are important to them so that's my that's my passionate uh, strong point of view about this subject and i and i do in fact think that with the the movable is the, the the needle is is beginning to move great charlotte how about you do you uh, uh, see anything interesting oh for sure i think terry I, I love your enthusiasm about this one and i would agree by and large that sustainability is a super important and very impactful topic globally but i think as we have done so far in the conversation i almost have to frame it as a tale of two countries so if you were to sort of contrast the US and China as two different markets, right? In the US, like Terry already mentioned, on the public market side, more and more, well, it's, this started five, six years ago, public companies are facing pressure from investors to be more ESG conscious. So publish reports around what they're doing with their labor force, with their, with, with their production and manufacturing and so on. So that is already in place. But then if you look at the new up and coming DTC brands, you have, you know, the, 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 the list goes on and on from Everlane to Rothy's to all of these. They, they speak to um, the value of sustainability and transparency and responsible sourcing and all of that um, to the point where I think, like, like Terry said, it's almost table stakes now. I think a new DTC brand cannot afford to come to the scene without being thoroughly prepared to get as ask questions about are you ethically made? Are you sustainably sourced? How transparent? How much do you know about the labor that is actually producing this? So I think it almost becomes a point of risk management um, when new brands come to the U.S. market to be super thoughtful and well prepared around this topic. And sometimes the more vocal, the more centerpiece sustainability is to your brand value, the more scrutiny that you face. So even our own brands, we have Everlane and then recently, I think Allbirds, um, are faced with a lot of consumer activism and questioning around, are you greenwashing your brand? Are you just telling a story? Or do you actually know what is going on every step of the way? Because if you pick on cotton as an example, the upstream, the supply chain globally is actually very opaque. It is very hard for a downstream player to know exactly on which farm in India, wherever it might be in Asia, like what condition the farmers are working in to pick your cotton. So to actually deliver it end to end is not easy. But in the U.S., I think people are converging on the consensus that it's important and brands need to be um, do a better job. And brands are doing a better job with it relative to before. Very briefly to touch on China, though, I think on the other hand, uh, your young consumers, your millennial and Gen Z broadly recognize sustainability to be a good thing. But is it important enough to them yet that one, they're willing to pay a premium? for sustainable uh, for sustainable products two is it important enough that brands are coming out into the market uh purely with the story around sustainability and responsible uh sourcing and so on not yet so consumers in the market are still much more driven to things like design premium quality um value for money or you know different domestic values that speak to them so i think that part is yet to migrate and really take root here Great. Joy, you want to sum, sum everything up? We have uh, two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can sum everything up, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm aware of Aubers entering China in you know, it's very different game. There, Actually, HBS you know? Woman is leading that initiative. I think the right the CEO is a HBS woman as well. Charlotte, I think so. Um, I know that I know there are a couple of HBS alum in the upper on the operates team in China. I don't know if the China CEO is HBS. If so, I should reach out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> like a uh, sustainability is just a is a is a keyword now for all most of the U.S. you know fashion retailer these days. They actually you know realizing it's an important keyword, um, especially for consumers to search on Google. They are looking for sustainable fashion, um, but you know in other parts of the world is not so much 
And I actually, you know, I myself is very into organic products, <laughs> you know, uh, but I realized, you know, uh, lots of farmers cannot even afford to get the organic label. So I think, you know, to really play the environmental, um, really promote the environmental thing, you know, the government also have to kind of be more <laughs> relaxed about the standards because you know there's lots of farmers who are producing organic products but they cannot afford this label like Shirley mentioned it's really become a risk management thing and i've seen you know uh, competing environmental brand attacking each other saying that your brand is not an environmental my brand is <laughs> because uh -huh. because they realize the consumers who are in this field are so picky about whether there's environmental <laughs> so uh yeah, so I, I feel bad for a lot of my friends who are in the environmental business, you know, they're they're really risking a lot. <laughs> but uh, I, I do, you know, think, you know, this year we all seeing what the environmental can do to a work, you know, I, I we've we experienced heat waves, things that we have never experienced before. So, um, yeah, yeah. So look forward to look forward to have everything you know environmental sustainable and hopefully technology can also helping to you know standardize the whole uh, experience um, and also lower the cost so that we lower that we have less weights um, yeah <laughs> awesome thank you thank you terry shall enjoy this is a great great discussion i i can't believe an hour just flew by like that i can have another many many hours with you guys but you know but thank you so much for your time this is great it's a pleasure yeah thank you everyone for attending on thursday night and then early morning i guess in china so thank you so much have a good thank evening you, thank you thank, thank you, you terry thank you joy thank you, thanks carmen bye thank you kathy bye yeah, lots of thanks in the uh, chat. So <laughs> thanks, Kathy. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.